pizza with a mission to return religion to the public square, billing itself as the sword and shield for people of faith. Together, these outside forces have lined up experts in science, philosophy, history, and religion prepared to deliver several months' worth of testimony. Outside legal teams have descended on the community. Millions of dollars are being expended. The media glare is relentless. Even Casey's husband, Jeff Brown, a 54-year-old electrician who once served on the Dover School Board, landed on tev television on Comedy's channel's The Daily Show in an episode titled Evolution Schmevolution. The expenditure of energy and time seems staggering to Casey in a battle neither side feels it can afford to lose. Casey is one of the few in town who seem to realize that everyone in Dover has already lost a great deal. As Casey haltingly testifies about her recollections of these times, her voice quivers. She sips water and sits almost painfully erect. In the gallery, sitting on one of the hard wooden pews that look almost indistinguishable from church pews, Alan Bonzel watches the president of the school board, a thickly handsome man with a bushy mustache and the hint of a grin, as if he knows something most others don't know. Occasionally, the back of his neck turns red at some bit of testimony, but he almost never loses that small grin. It turns out that he, too, kept a list of the same sort Reverend Grove kept. He told me, Casey Brown testifies in her shaking voice, that I would be going to hell. This country wasn't founded on Muslim beliefs or evolution, Another board member exhorted the citizens of Dover during the pivotal school board meeting. This country was founded on Christianity and our students should be taught as such. That was the moment Casey began to be afraid, not of one individual. She was afraid of what this controversy would do to a community that she loved. I was afraid Dover would never be the same, she says after court, finally relaxing in her own home, away from the glare and the attention, and I was right. And I like to skip ahead a little bit in the story and talk a little bit about how Americans in general view this subject. Most Americans could not say who Gordon Gould was or John Logie Baird or Nikola Tesla or Edward Jenner or Jack Kilby, although the work of these scientists is ever present in our daily lives, part of our culture, our entertainment, our communications, our defense, our medical care, our entire medical, our entire modern technology. The world in general, and America in particular, would be unrecognizable without them. Our lives immeasurably poorer and quite probably shorter, yet most of us couldn't pick them out of a lineup, much less an encyclopedia. So who are they? Gould invented the first laser, the ubiquitous device that makes possible CD and DVD players, fiber optics, military targeting systems, and bladeless scalpels that perform life-saving surgeries unimaginable a generation ago. Baird invented television and changed the world, Why Tesla powered it, having invented a way to deliver alternating current to home users and our modern electrical infrastructure, the one in which day after day, without consumers giving it a thought, the lights go on and the toasters toast and the garage doors open and the respirators pump air into the lungs of premature babies. Kilby invented the microchip, another omnipresent device, the silicon brain and some computers and cars and nuclear reactors and iPods and Game Boys, the transitional techno fossil bridging the mechanical and digital ages. And the Englishman Jenner saved lives and ended terrible scourges by inventing the first vaccination, defeating smallpox, and pointing the way for an army of other disease vanquishers. These great men, these scientists for the ages, dominate our households, but they are not household names. America loves to consume the fruits of science, but we are mostly oblivious to how the stuff works and of the men and women who discover it for us. Even the giants among them are surprisingly anonymous. Only three scientists of significance have achieved lasting name recognition among Americans in the 21st century, and none of them is directly linked with any of the technological wonders the nation so prizes. There is Einstein, who, he, who became a true celebrity notwithstanding the fact that few Americans even remotely understand his science. His fame endures mostly because his name has become a noun, a synonym for egghead, the ultimate colloquial immortality, and because his crazy-haired photograph is a perennial favorite on posters. There is Newton, remembered not so much for his invention of calculus and physics as for the apocryphal story of an apple falling on his head to inspire the theory of gravity, or perhaps it's for the venerable cookie that shares his name. And finally, there is Darwin, the only scientist who has achieved both lasting fame and lasting infamy in America. 
He has inspired generations of scientists and evangelicals to do battle, and his thinking remains as relevant and provocative today as it was a century and a half ago. His writings, data, and reasoning are still plumbed and studied in the 21st century by biologists, paleontologists, and botanists. One of the nation's leading paleontologists and evolutionary biologist, Kevin Padian, a pioneer in studying the evolution of dinosaurs and birds, says that he and his colleagues still find new ideas and insights in Darwin's work. Padian teaches advanced graduate seminars on Darwin at the University of California, Berkeley. He finds that even his top students, already well on their way to becoming accomplished biologists, are blown away by what Darwin achieved and how little they really understood of his life his scientific accomplishments and the obstacles he faced. Darwin's influence, of course, extends far beyond the world of science. Alone among scientists, Darwin has inspired continuing political and cultural movements in America, some in support of his views, but most, for the most part against him and against what he is thought to represent. Over time, he has become an archetype, a mythic figure, at once revered and demonized, routinely ranked by scientists as one of the three or four most important thinkers in history, and just as routinely ranked with Hitler and Marx in the religious rights roster of evil. As with most myths, the true Darwin and the nature of his research have become clouded in the popular imagination. His philosophy mischaracterized, his quotations misused, his shy and gentle personality vilified, and his science, the seemingly familiar theory of evolution, mangled beyond recognition. This, too, is part of the story of Dover. The simple truth is that Charles Darwin did not invent evolution. He didn't even initially use the term, preferring instead the phrase descent with modification, or the word transmutation. His seminal book, The Origin of Species, which laid out the basis of his life work, and which he continued to build on for decades, uses the word evolved exactly once. It is the very last word in the book. Nor did Darwin think up the notion that life progresses, develops, or evolves over time. That idea has been around a long time, before, long before he was born. And in most, the general sense of organisms adapting to survive and thrive was never particularly controversial. It was the mechanism evolution, the mysterious process causing it to occur, and the extent to which a species could or could not be transformed that got people riled, challenged conventional wisdom and belief, and became the focus of Darwin's research. He was content to let his writings speak for themselves and to continue writing books that examine plant and human evolution and then the evolution of emotions and human psychology, leaving his supporters in the scientific community def to defend his theories. They did so vociferously and, in the end, successfully. The Origin of Species was reprinted many times and was the last great work of science written both for a specialized readership of scientists and for a mass audience. It was widely read throughout the world, lauded, mocked, satirized, and discussed until it became entrenched in the popular imagination, a cultural touchstone of enlightenment or corrupt materialism, depending on the point of view. The weight of the evidence as Darwin's century drew to a close seemed to scientists to favor evolution and its power to explain so many diverse observations and natural processes. By the time Darwin died in 1882, his ideas were being taught in universities worldwide, replacing the works of William Paley, whom he had studied, and the original advocates of intelligent design. Darwin had won the first battle, but not the war. What was so fascinating about the testimony at the trial at Dover, when it touched on these issues, when the school board members were asked to testify about why they rejected the theory of evolution, explain it to us. What is the theory of evolution? They couldn't do it. And then, even more surprising, they were asked to explain what's intelligent design that you've mandated for thousands of kids to learn about. Couldn't do that either. They just knew what they liked and they knew what they didn't like and didn't go past that. And that's where much of the country is at. Two-thirds of Americans may reject evolution or doubt it, but they don't have a good idea what it is.